Sephardic Jews had come of age under Islam. In that glorious country of Al-Andalus, the Jews of the Iberian Peninsula, now calling themselves Sephardim, had fashioned a glorious culture. But the Christians, the Christians who had been defeated by the Muslims in the early 8th century, the Christians who had lived in the north, they began slowly to attack Muslim strongholds. At first, these skirmishes did not really amount to much, but by the time we get to the mid-11th and the end of the 11th century, Christian forces are gaining in strength, gaining in power. In 1085, the Christians capture the city of Toledo, so significant for them because for them it was a return to the Visigothic capital. And there was born the idea of the Reconquista, that it was the Christians' destiny to take back the peninsula, that which was rightfully theirs. The Jews, we saw, were in quite a conundrum. What were they going to do? The Muslims who had nurtured them and protected them, those weren't the same Muslims at the end of the 11th century, because in the wake of the Christian onslaught, Muslims from North Africa, who did not have a tolerant disposition toward the peoples of the book, had taken over. These were the Almoravides. And Jews were no longer comfortable within the orbit of Islam. And in the world of Christendom, that was a scary world for them. They did not know much about that world. And indeed, those who may have had some historical memory could only have thought of the Visigoths and those terrible years of Visigothic persecution. Yes, Jews left the peninsula. Yehuda Halevi had traveled to the land of Israel. And very famously, Maimonides and his family. Oh, the son of Maimon, Moshe ben Maimon, the great Jewish philosopher and legal scholar who was born in the city of Cordova in about 1135, he and his family need to leave the peninsula, forced to in 1148 as a new Muslim tribe from North Africa, the Almohades, the Almuachidun, those who professed the unity of God, had conquered the Muslim territory and they were fierce toward the Jews. It was either convert to Islam or die, and Maimonides and his family leave for North Africa, and later the great Maimonides settles in Egypt. Even in Egypt, Maimonides still was the great exemplar of Sephardic culture, working in the court as a physician for the Muslim leader, even as he was head of the local Jewish community, and even as he responded to Jewish concerns far and wide. But let's return to the peninsula. What did most of the Jews do? Most of the Jews, interestingly, migrated north to the Christian kingdoms. The Christian kingdoms, by the 11th and 12th century, began to emerge in a form that we are going to recognize and recognize as individual polities throughout the Middle Ages. Let's look at the map. The map of current Spain and Portugal, and let's try to imagine what the Christian kingdoms looked like in the Middle Ages. If you can imagine, imagine an eastern kingdom called the Crown of Aragon. Oh, its constituent parts was the Kingdom of Aragon, Catalonia on the coast of the Mediterranean, the Kingdom of Valencia, and even later the islands, the I the Balearic Islands of Mallorca and Menorca and Ibiza. The central Christian kingdom was the Kingdom of Castile, uh, which occupied most of the central plateau of the peninsula. Up north, between Aragon and Castile, was the small Pyrenean Kingdom of Navarre. And then, all the way in the west, the Kingdom of Portugal, in what today, in fact, is uh, the Republic of Portugal. Now, the Christians had conquered. Most of the peninsula was now under their control. And the Muslims, over the course of a few centuries of fighting, was 
limited. The Muslims were limited to the small emirate of Granada. In other words, most of the peninsula was now Christian, and the Muslims simply had a political stronghold. So when we talk about Sephardic Jews from about the early 13th century, and as we will see until the end of the 15th century, we're talking about the Jews who lived under the medieval Christian kingdoms of Castile, Aragon, Navarre, and Portugal. And these Christian kingdoms treated the Jews quite well. Yes, the Jews were concerned leaving the world of Islam and moving now into the Christian kingdoms of Iberia. Ah, but the Jews, the Jews were welcomed. Interestingly, one of the core reasons for the acceptance of the Jews in the Iberian Peninsula, whether under Islam or later under Christendom, was precisely because there were three religions and three cultures within the peninsula. Throughout Jewish history, when the Jews have been the sole minority within a country, it's been quite difficult for them. Then the Jews become the radical other. Yes, we know how they become the lightning rod for all difficulties which emerge within society, within the politics and culture of the time. But within the Iberian Peninsula, there were three cultures and civilizations. The Muslims, we remember, beat back the Christians. During Muslim times, the Muslims were on top, the Christians were the enemy, and the Jews were a much prized, if you will, third world people. And under the Christian kingdoms, the Muslims were the enemy. They were the ones who had just been defeated. And the Jews prized again as being middlemen. These new Christian conquerors needed people who could be their allies, needed people who could speak Arabic and speak to the conquered Muslims. They needed Jews who were well versed in being merchants, who were urban dwellers. The Christian conquerors had come from up north in the peninsula where they were mainly farmers or they were pasturers of animals. They took over the great cities of Andalusi Islam, and they needed folks to populate it. They needed merchants who knew how to make those cities thrive. And so for political reasons and for economic reasons, the Jews are welcomed. They're welcomed into the cities and towns of the Iberian Peninsula. They're welcomed into the diplomatic service as they negotiate with Muslims. They were very, very much needed people. And if we look at the kingdoms, especially of Castile and Aragon, we watch how the Jews rise in the service to these monarchies. In a way, the history of the Jewish people under the Muslim rule is now repeated under the Christians. Under the great Ferdinand III of Castile, who had conquered so much of the territory from Islam, the Jews are now among his most trusted advisors. And in the kingdom of Aragon, which borders the Mediterranean, under James I, the conqueror, the Jews rise to such great posts that the Jews even are seen as being in control of the royal treasury. In control of the royal treasury because that was the will of James I. The Christian middle class had not yet matured, and the Jews were needed for their financial acumen. So much so were the Jews prized by James I that when the papacy in the mid-13th century, having heard about the Jews' meteoric rise under a Christian king's rule, the Pope at that time warns James I that Jews should not have su such significant positions within Christian society. James I write back, writes back to the Pope and tells him that we don't have any Jews in such employ. Basically, James I did not tell the Pope the truth. It's not that the Pope was tricked. The Pope knew of the Jews' significant role in the crown of Aragon. James knew that the Pope knew. Everyone knew. 
But this testifies to the crucial nature of the Jews' political and economic standing. The Jews in the Christian kingdoms were intimately connected to the royal central authority. And in that sense, there was a seamless transition, if you will, of the Jewish courtier class from Al-Andalus to now the Christian kingdoms of the north. But in many respects, Sephardic culture was not the same. Sometimes when we think about Jewish culture in general, or if we think about Sephardic Judaism or Sephardic culture, perhaps without reflection we imagine that there was a culture which developed at a particular time, and it's the same culture which we even can observe and enjoy today. But Sephardic culture, like Jewish culture generally and civilizations all across the world, even while maintaining the same name and some of the same ideas, have undergone quite an astounding change. And if we look at Sephardic culture in the 13th century, Sephardic culture was not similar to that which had emerged in the 10th century under Islam. Because, and here, let's go back to the map, but here we are with uh, Spain and Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula, which we recognize, but now with more of the world. And if you remember, Sephardic culture had emerged really as a result of being within the Islamic orbit. The influence of Baghdad, the influence of Near Eastern and Mediterranean culture was great on Islam. So when you as a Sephardic Jew would imagine where to turn for your cultural ideas, you really turned south and turned east, North Africa into the Middle East. But now, there were Christian kingdoms up north. And therefore, a Sephardic Jew living within the Christian kingdom of Aragon, Castile, Navarre, or Portugal, did not necessarily look to North Africa and the Near East, but now looked northward. Northward to where there were Jews in other Christian kingdoms. In fact, these Jews in the Rhine River Valley in the growing larger royal domains of, of France and of England and of the Holy Roman Empire, these Jews were called Ashkenazim. And now in the 13th century, when the Jews of Sepharad are living under Christian kings, they are looking less toward the south and toward the west, but rather they are looking northward. Instead of imagining Sephardic culture as being the westernmost appendage of a large, glorious Jewish civilization under Islam, we now need to look at Sephardic Jews as being the southwesternmost appendage of a large, glorious European Jewish culture. And therefore, Sephardic Jewish culture is now going to reflect some of the ideas and some of the notions that were beginning to obtain among the Ashkenazim in the north. Let me explain. Yes, Sephardic Jewry, as Jews generally uh, under Islam and Jews in so many countries of the world, uh, studied the Bible, studied the Talmud. But as we saw, Andalusi Jews as well were interested in the sciences, were interested in medicine, spent much time on philosophy. In fact, the study of philosophy for the Sephardic Jew was seen as the ultimate attainment. Sephardic Jews looked upon philosophy as the, an intricate, demanding study which would provide the finishing touches for a cultured individual. Now it's true, some of these subjects were still being pursued, even as Sephardic Jews now lived within the Christian orbit, but things had changed. For example, in the area of uh, biblical commentary, of which Sephardic Jews excelled both under Islam and under Christendom, here Sephardic Jews in the 13th century write biblical commentary, but more within the tradition of their Ashkenazi brethren. They are writing now commentaries which go line by line through the biblical text as the great Ashkenazi biblical commentator Rashi. 
Sephardic Jews who had spent so much time studying the Talmud are now also influenced by Rashi's children and grandchildren and the schools which he helps to found, which uh, study the Talmudic text and attempt valiantly to make sure that the Talmudic passages scattered across rabbinic literature can somehow cohere. This was the doctrine of the Ashkenazi Tosafists, and Tosafistic methodology crosses over the Pyrenees and influences uh, Sephardic Talmudic commentary. Oh, some of the great Talmud commentators of the 13th and 14th century of Nachmanides and of Shlomo Ibn Adret are very much taken with Ashkenazi Talmudic interpretation. And what about philosophy? What about philosophy, which was the acme of the Sephardi curriculum? What about philosophy, which also, as we know, was studied by the great Maimonides, whose wonderful work, The Guide for the Perplexed, written toward the end of the 12th century, became an instant classic among Sephardic Jews? In 13th century, Sephardic attitudes towards philosophy began to change. And the change, interestingly, came from north of the peninsula, but here from the area of Provence. In Provence, in the early 13th century, Provence, which was an area, a fascinating area, with so much of the Jewish learning under Islam, which was written in Arabic, like Maimonides' Guide for the Perplexed, was translated into Hebrew. And with its translation into Hebrew, these works of the Jews who had lived with the Muslims was now in a language which could be read by the Jews of Provence, by the Jews of the Rhine River Valley, and even by Sephardic Jews in the peninsula who weren't as well versed in Arabic as their ancestors had been. Provençal Jews seize upon the writings of Maimonides. They thrill to his philosophical discussions, to his integration of Judaism and Aristotelianism. But some Provençal Jews are none too happy. Maimonides had provided reasons for all of the biblical and Talmudic commandments. Maimonides had made Judaism a thoroughly rationalistic religion. And for some Provençal Jews, that was disquieting. Oh, they had no beef with Maimonides himself. They still looked upon him as that great eagle who soared above all other students of Judaism. But they were concerned not about Maimonides, or the books themselves, but that the influence that those volumes would have among other Provençal Jews. To be specific, they were concerned that when Maimonides provided reasons and rationales for the mitzvot, that Jews amongst whom they lived, who decided that those reasons and rationales no longer obtained, either that historically it simply made no sense anymore, or that humanity had developed to a point that those reasons simply did not make sense at this present time, then maybe it was no longer necessary to observe all of the commandments. And therefore, some Provençal rabbis saw in the writings of Maimonides a threat, a threat to the Jewish tradition and Jewish observance. The reason why these, uh, this controversy and what we call the Maimonidean controversy in Provence engages us is because the Maimonidean controversy spread beyond, spreads beyond its original uh, locus in Provence. Maimonidean controversy crosses over into Aragon, into Catalonia, the easternmost sector of Aragon, and even into central Castile and Toledo. When the rival factions in the Maimonidean controversy in Provence are looking for support in the Iberian Peninsula, they write to the Jews of Barcelona. And the Jews of Barcelona, pretty much, even though there is a debate, decide to support the pro-Maimonidean faction. And when emissaries are sent to the central area of Castile, to the city of Toledo, 
where one would expect here in the Central Plateau that Muslim ideas and uh, positive attitudes towards philosophy would prevail in the city of Toledo itself. Maimonides' detractors and Maimonides' proponents, in a way, fight to a draw. The city of Toledo is not able to support either side. My, how far Sephardic culture has traveled in this century, in these transitional years between Islam and Christendom. Now, philosophy is no longer seen as an unalloyed ally of rabbinic tradition. And indeed, other explanatory mechanisms and ideologies begin to uh, jostle philosophy for a place at the table. Jewish mystical ideas, which emerge in Provence as well in the 12th century, notions of what God must be like, of how this great, eternal, limitless God created human beings in this world with their foibles, notions about this ensof, this limitless God, these ideas of theosophical mysticism begin to emerge in the peninsula as well. In fact, in a variety of schools. Suffice it to say that philosophy now has competition. There are many different schools of thought that are attempting to explain the greater purpose of Jewish tradition. So when we look at Sephardic culture, we know that Sephardic culture has changed. Yes, the Bible is being studied, Talmud is being studied, Hebrew is being examined as a language very carefully, but the style of study of the Bible and Talmud is quite different. Philosophy, no longer the acme of the curriculum, is an uneasy hand made into Jewish practice. And Jewish mysticism the Kabbalah now begins to emerge as a true competitor of philosophical study. And yes, although politically the Jews now found a home in the courts of the Christian monarchs, there too were changes in the Jewish political stance. We saw how the Jews were welcomed in the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon, and how they were so much prized by the kings of these kingdoms. But truth to tell, the transition from Islam to Christianity was not simply moving from one overlord to another. And the true reason for this was theological. Although the Jews had a measure of security both under Islam and under Christendom, Islam was generally far more tolerant to the Jews than Christianity was. And for very simple reasons. Under Islam, the Jews possessed a form of the truth. Oh, a truth that had been perverted, a truth that was not well understood, but a religious truth nonetheless. When Muhammad, the great prophet, gave the Quran to the Arabian peoples, Muhammad had now provided the updated, the pristine version and record of what it is that God, of what Allah wanted. And therefore the Jews possessed a truth, but an incomplete one. Under Christianity, the Jews were the people who had killed the Son of God at the turning point of history. And the Jews as a deicide people were always looked upon with suspicion. Yes, the Jewish Bible had been taken over by the Christians, and the Jewish Bible had been seen as the Old Testament, but the Old Testament that was superseded by the New. And therefore the Jews were always able to find a greater symbiosis with Islam and its culture than they could with Christianity. I'll give you a few examples. Alfonso X of Castile, who had succeeded his father, Ferdinand III, he welcomed the Jews as well. Jews uh, were at his court. Jews also were involved in some of the great cultural endeavors of Alfonso X. 
in the city of Toledo, Jews helped Christians translate the works, philosophical and scientific, that had been developed under Islam, translate these works into Latin and then into the vernacular. Jews were active in the creation of the Alphensine tables of these astronomical calculations. Jews were clearly very, very crucial to Alfonso's cultural project of being, in a way, his kingdom and he himself the heir to the great traditions, ultimately, of Greece and Rome. Alfonso X, though, as well, also turned against the Jews in the latter part of his reign, suspicious of some of the courtiers. And in, indeed, in his great law code, the Siete Partidas, the Seven Parts, where he devoted an entire section toward the Jews, and where he spoke about the synagogue in glowing terms as a place where the name of God is praised, still gave voice to ideas that were beginning to emerge from the northern Christian kingdoms. Ideas that began uh, in the Middle Ages in the 12th century in England ideas that the Jews at specific times, if you will, at the time of the Passover holiday, would sacrifice young Christian children for the Jews' own ritual purposes. It's doubtful whether Alfonso truly believed in such accusations. And indeed, in his law code, he makes sure that he was going to protect the Jews from such uh, false libels. But Alfonso X, by giving voice to these blood libels within the context of his law code, indicated that Jewish security, while at this point was something that could be relied upon, maybe perhaps in the future could be called into question. And in the crown of Aragon, where James I had stood up to the Pope and made sure that the Jews who were indeed managing the royal treasury during his reign would not be affected. Even James I, protector of the Jews, and a monarch who thoroughly understood the significance of the Jews for him both politically and economically, perforce was influenced by ideas from Christian Europe that began to spill over the Pyrenees. In the mid-13th century in France, attention began to be paid by some Christians to the Jews' works, to the Jews' religious works which were composed after the Bible had been canonized. The Jews did not only read the Bible, but the Jews also had a long and much esteemed oral tradition an oral tradition which set about as its task to explain the commandments and traditions of the Pentateuch. These traditions were written down in the Talmud and later in later works of rabbinic literature. These Christians began to look upon some of these Jewish rabbinic works and wondered about them. And specifically they wondered about them because in the 13th century across Europe the Christians began again to revisit an age-old problem. The age-old problem for these Christians is how could the Jews, who with the Christians shared at least part of the Bible, the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament, could not see the light and understand Jesus as the Jew's Savior. In the mid-13th century, thanks in part to some Jewish converts to Christianity, the Christians begin to take a look at rabbinic literature. And what the Christians decide is that it's rabbinic literature which is swaying the minds of the Jews. The Jews don't simply look at the Bible because to the Christians, if the Jews would simply look at the plain meaning of the Bible, they would understand that Jesus was the Messiah. Ah, but Jews are influenced by rabbinic literature, and rabbinic literature clouds their minds. And in an attempt in the 13th century to convert the Jews, and parenthetically to convert Muslims, and generally to spread Christendom, which was at the height of its power, the Christians begin to study rabbinic literature. 
the Talmud is put on trial in Paris in 1240 and found wanting because of what the Christians felt are blasphemies against God and the Holy Family. But the notion of the importance of rabbinic literature and its centrality for the ultimate conversion of the Jews, these ideas come through France, across the Pyrenees, and find root in Catalonia. James I, who was quite a pious Christian, is influenced by ideas promoted by Dominicans and Franciscans that they should get a chance to explain to the Jews of his kingdom that indeed rabbinic literature is going to be to the key to their salvation. But there's a catch here. The Christians argue that if rabbinic literature is going to be studied, the Jews are going to note that even the rabbis themselves believed in Jesus. What an extraordinary argument, seemingly preposterous on the surface. But the Christians who truly believed in the truth of their religion imagined that even the Jews' own writings would point to that truth. And the mendicant orders, the preaching orders of the Dominicans and the Franciscans, they are able to convince James I to hold a disputation in the city of Barcelona where they're going to get a public chance to demonstrate to the Jews that indeed their own religious writings are convinced of the truth of Christianity. James I invites a Jewish defender of the faith. He invites none other than the great Nachmanides, the towering 13th century Sephardic intellectual, to defend the Jewish faith, which he attempts to do valiantly in 1263 in Barcelona. Oh, the disputation which takes two weeks. Nachmanides feels at the end that perhaps he emerged victorious. The Christians feel the same. But for us who are observing Sephardic culture and are observing also the Jews' political security, we now have to pause. It's the same James I who protects the Jews and places them in important positions, defends them against the Pope. It's the same James I that allows a public disputation to take place in this Mediterranean commercial city where the Christians are getting a chance to prove to the Jews that indeed Christianity is the true religion. Ah, the Jews can't be too secure, can they? We come to the end of the 13th century marveling at the Jews' transition to the Christian kingdoms, their economic and political security, and indeed their comfort in the 13th century. And as students of Sephardic Jewry, we are really feeling confident that the culture which they created under Islam has now continued under Christendom. And that is all true. But at the same time that we observe the demographic transposition of population and the movement of culture, we also take note. We take note of ideas of the blood libel coming into Castile. We take note of the notion of the conversion of the Jews to Christianity beginning to blossom within Catalonia. And on the eve of the 14th century, we wonder what the future will be.